So welcome to this last session of this course. Uh, I actually wanted to demonstrate uh, the technology which is used to build spoken tutorials. All of you are familiar with spoken tutorials or no? Okay. So in this session, I wanted to tell you two important things. One is that increasingly the technical literature assets will be more and more in digital form. So all of you are familiar with say Khan Academy lectures or the NPTEL lectures and so on. The difference between Khan Academy lectures and NPTEL lectures currently is that NPTEL lectures are actually video shoots of the complete lectures delivered by teachers. So the teacher is very much visible, the teacher is teaching a class. Sometimes the recording is from a normal class, sometimes the recording is in a studio. But essentially, the face and the body language of the teacher is the main important thing in that lesson or in that lecture. Khan Academy, on the other hand, if you have seen Khan Academy lectures, the face is not visible. So it's a recognition that the person behind the delivery or communication is not as important as the content of the communication and of course the form in which the communication is, uh, uh, the contents are conveyed. Now, let us look at the development of content expression or content communication that has happened over last 2500 years. What was the model 2000 years ago of educational communication? Nobody knows. Uh, 2,500 years ago, the written script was not very well established and not very well known. Okay, the script was evolving. In fact, in Mahabharata time, people were illiterate. That is why Vyasa had to invoke Ganesha to write Mahabharata. So the written script is a much later happening. The earlier, whether it is in the Greek time or in the earlier Indian days, the learning teaching used to be through discourses. So a teacher with a lot of disciples. And as we all know, the churches, mosques, temples served as the infrastructure for these discourses. The development of the current university system or college system as we know it is a much later happening. This situation remained similar to this for a long period of time till about 250 years ago or slightly, well, around that time. I like to define epochs in these are all years. So I just mentioned how the contents were expressed and communicated for 2,500 years. Then came the era of 250 years roughly, give or take a few 50 or 100 years, when Gutenberg happened. What did Gutenberg do? Printing press. Everybody knows or some people have not heard of Gutenberg. How many of you have not heard of Gutenberg? Oh, God bless you. Okay. So I will tell you about Gutenberg and I will also tell you about Gutenberg project, which is a much later happening. So Gutenberg actually made it's not that printing was unknown. Printing was well known. Chinese, in fact, had discovered printing much earlier. There were litho presses and such things which were available so that uh, some manuscripts were available in printed form. But they could not be scaled up in delivering large number of such copies and they were not affordable. Gutenberg invented a printing press which was usable by many he invented actually those 
what you call that type uh, font, not type fonts, but uh, well, something by which people could assemble text and print it. And pages after pages could be printed. What it resulted in is the universalization of education. Many of you may not be aware that education was limited to few elite for centuries together, for millennia in fact. Only few elite could be educated. Ordinary people could not be educated. From Indian mythology, you know the well-known story that Eklavya was refused education by the Dronacharya school because he did not belong to a particular category of people. Okay. The fact that people yearning to learn should be able to learn became possible only somewhere in the last 250 years. And the Gutenberg's technological invention has been an important point in, in achieving that. This continued for a long time and the so-called universalization of education spread. Printed books is what we have all used so far. All of you are familiar with books, right? All of you are familiar with second-hand books, third-hand books, whatever, whatever. The second-hand, third-hand markets grew in response to the need for affordability. If I have 100 rupees to spend and if I can buy only one book, then by going to a second-hand shop, I can buy maybe four books in 100 rupees. And those four books could still be relevant if they deal with some basic fundamentals which have not changed, let us say, over the last few years or so. Even research publications were mostly in the printed form. This also gave rise to the notion of intellectual property preserved in the form of copyrights. Expression is copyrighted, patents are for products. The, the IP or intellectual property rights were defined such that the copyright would be available to the person creating that expression for a limited period of time. And after that, the right would belong to all people. So the, this is something I do not know whether you are aware. The patent laws and the copyright laws were originally not perceived so much to protect the person who has created the copyright and patent, but were perceived to protect the humanity to ensure that such protected knowledge flows back to the human pool. Unfortunately, over the period of time when the free market economy gained currency, people who were interested in commercially exploiting such contents, okay, kept on pressurizing governments after governments to enhance the IP protection law. Do you know that in the United States, for example, if there is an author who holds a copyright on a book, the copyright is available to the holder 70 years after the death of the creator. Incidentally, the creator rarely enjoys the fruit of that copyright. All authors of books are required to give their copyright to the publisher. So it's the publisher which, who owns the copyright on behalf of the author. Author is, of course, given some commission or something like that. But the copyright owner now, which is a publishing house, will enjoy that copyright 70 years after the author is dead. Now, that's a commercial exploitation. Like it or not, that is how many of the rules are. In response to this, when computers first came in, and it was possible that digital media could actually get published text available and made accessible as digital media. A project was started, which was called Gutenberg Project. If you have not heard of Gutenberg, you would not have heard of Gutenberg Project also. This Gutenberg Project was started by an IBMer who was working on an IBM mainframe. And he said that the best form of expression, which people can easily access and read, are ASCII characters. So he said plain ASCII characters, he would get useful contents in the form of readable books, digitally readable books, and will make them available in public domain. The open source licenses, etc., had not emerged at that point in time. He simply said they are available for anybody to read, modify, whatever, whatever. 
when he conceived of this project, I think the first uh, first piece that he published was the American uh, Constitution or some such thing. Then he wanted to publish books on computers, operating system, as was known then, system software, etc., etc. And he suddenly hit the wall of intellectual property. Nobody would be willing to give him the rights to say that, okay, you can take this book and make it available. Then he dug back and found out which are the books which are out of intellectual property, which have no, no confusion. And surprisingly, guess what he found? He found that Bible was not copyrighted, Gita was not copyrighted, Quran was not copyrighted. And then he figured out that these and similar creations of content probably are far more valuable to humanity than a discourse on operating system and this. So he enlarged the scope of the Gutenberg project to say all useful material which people should read would be put in. Created a large volunteer force across the world. There are more than 46,000 books available under Gutenberg project. Freely downloadable, freely distributable, freely usable, freely editable. And you are not even aware of that. Okay. Many of them are uh, uh, books on science, books on technology, they are, they are very good creations. Subsequently, when the web came, and that is what happened in last 25 years. So all of you are familiar with the legacy of uh, Tim Berners-Lee. Not very enthusiastic, not. Who was Tim Berners-Lee? My God, don't tell me, many of you don't know that. The creator of the first browser. No? Okay. Internet was there ever since ARPA network came. And on internet, people could exchange files. File transfer was available. Some rudimentary emails were available. But the availability of all these documents in different forms did not mean much to individuals who wanted some material from here, some material from here. While they are reading this, they would like to go somewhere else and read something else, some paragraph in some place else. So that is where HTML came into being. And HTML made all the difference because the markup language permitted links to be established, digital links to be established. Incidentally, most of the Gutenberg project books are now available in HTML format as well. Okay. These formats are important because they mean a lot of convenience to people who read that material. So as a part of communication, it is very important that all of us should be able to create such material as well. Typically, the written expression that we are all familiar with, language is one aspect, of course, correctness of language is another aspect. But in the form in which you present it, and in the form in which you make it available so that it is maximally accessible is still not a solved problem for most of us. We create a file for a content and that file is posted. So as I mentioned the other day, people don't care, uh, people don't take care to name their files properly. So if there are 120 files which are submitted to me, I can't figure out which file is submitted by whom and what is the topic. Whereas it is possible to make a repository in modern times which can be interconnected, concepts can be interconnected, presentations can be interconnected and people can easily navigate through these. You need something much more than HTML of course, but it is now possible to do that. In fact, the dynamic databases as we speak of today, for example, people fill up forms, people fill up their information. So you look at any time in the ASC website, if somebody registers yesterday, that person's name appears today, if as a teacher I look at the role list. How does that happen? Because the name and other information was inserted when the student registered, say yesterday evening, but any time from that point onwards, if anybody refreshes the page showing the list of students, dynamically from that database, the current list of students is picked up and is shown. This ability to dynamically display changed contents was not feasible earlier. It was not feasible even when the early computers came. It became feasible because of the web, 
because of the huge dispersion of the web and therefore because of it the need and the possibility of making such contents meaningful to people. Web therefore has transformed the contents completely in the last 25 years. Just note that what happened in this duration in terms of contents, their accessibility and their affordability, more happened in the next 250 years. And what happened in 250 years after Gutenberg's print is press, much more than that has happened in these 25 years. So that is the pace at which the availability and accessibility of content has increased in humanity. I want you to be aware of that. And I want you to be aware of what is happening now. So in this context, I would like you to consider the last two and a half years. What has happened in the last two and a half years, which is remarkably different from the point of view of education, not just educational content. Yes. MOOCs have happened. Massive online open courses. They take content to a different plateau altogether. Please note that the Khan Academy individual lectures or NPTEL lectures or the books and chapters or even the connection site, which I just mentioned once from Rice University, where different modules are authored by different people and anybody could combine these modules to create a printed book. The massive online courses combine the conventional discourse that happens over, let us say, a semester or a year, where a complete subject is taught to people in some kind of a sequence of lectures, practice problems, quizzes, assignments, lectures, more problems, more lectures, examinations. This is the sequence through which we traditionally learn. Now, what is being attempted is to use modern technology to implement this sequence online. And that is what is massive open online courses. So Coursera, EDX, Udacity, as I mentioned, these are the people who are actually creating those courses, eight to nine minute videos, some practice problems, some online quiz, you answer them, next, etc., etc., etc. And now suddenly, a single offering can be taken by hundreds of thousands of people across the country, the same offering. This was not feasible earlier. Now this has happened in the last two and a half years only. And the pace at which this has been increasing matches the pace at which things increased in 25 years. The first set of learners on the first MOOCs offering were five to 8,000. Within a year, when the first year anniversary was actually celebrated by Coursera and EDX, each one of them had 100,000 participants in a course that they were offering. In the last year, the number of 100,000 registered people for different courses has increased the number of courses available on web has increased. More recently, in the last six months, universities of the universities, top universities in the US, several in Europe, are actually adopting the MOOCs kind of training for teaching their own courses in their university. IIT Bombay will start teaching two courses in this fashion from coming semester. One in thermodynamics, one in computer program. It completely derails the conventional delivery of courses. No lectures, as I said, flip classroom, but this is becoming popular. It is very obvious to many of us that over the next 10, 15 years, this will become the main delivery mechanism and platform for knowledge to people, for learning. Everywhere, including in schools, the developed countries will adopt this faster. Countries like India, Malaysia, China, Afghanistan, Pakistan have to follow, have to do it, and we have to do it faster because we don't have much time. And all that brings me to the important point. What are the peculiarities of written communication or recorded communication that we must learn, practice, 
and become experts in so that useful material for these kind of composite offerings can be created by a large number of people. The people out there who are conventional teachers will probably add the contents once they learn the mechanism of delivery. But we need tools. We need software tools which will facilitate such creation. And the job of computer science people would be to create such tools. The job of computer science students would be to popularize such tools, to examine such tools, work collaboratively. It is in that context that I wanted to tell you about one particular effective communication which is known as, well, we can say Khan Academy lectures are something similar. The concept of spoken tutorial in India was started by Professor Kannan Maudgalya of IIT Bombay. For the last several years, he has been pursuing that. He has developed a team which builds these spoken tutorials. The original idea was to popularize free and open source software. So they started building spoken tutorials on free and open source software. They were very clear right from the beginning, that team led by Professor Kannan Maudgalya, that whatever mechanisms that we create, they should be scalable, they should be affordable, and both users of spoken tutorials as well as creators of spoken tutorials should be able to do so with the greatest possible ease. The only assumption was that digital interface is available to the learner. If a network is also available, well and good, but that is not necessary. So what they did is they started creating these, what they call 10 minute tutorial. So for example, you have a, a, a series of tutorials in Python programming. You have a series of tutorials on Linux. You have a series of tutorials on open office or libre office. He discovered that a large number of people in India pay for such office usage, usage software in, in most places. And that cost is very heavy, whereas LibreOffice is free. So what they did is they built these tutorials. These tutorials can be heard by anyone. If you just need a, you just have a headphone. A 10 rupee headphone which is available in the market, thanks to the Chinese manufacturing, is adequate. You just put that headphone there, click the, the uh, spoken tutorial, and the spoken tutorial will tell you, starting from how to install LibreOffice, how to edit a document, how to do etc., etc. And the important thing is that the spoken tutorials are designed such that in one window you can open the spoken tutorial, in another window you can actually open LibreOffice. So if you have a problem in saying, how do I insert some text somewhere in between, you can go to the corresponding open tutorial, which actually has screenshots and spoken words, and you can listen to that and say, ah, this is what, I take the cursor here, click left, I get the cursor there, then I type, etc., etc. Very simple words, effective words. Now the way they create these spoken tutorials is what is important to us in this series on effective communication. First of all, they write a script. Then the script is read. First series of slides are made like you can say PowerPoint slides. Well, they don't use Microsoft PowerPoint, they use LibreOffice again. But you can have PDF files or whatever, whatever. No human being is seen, only the voice is recorded. Because one of the ambitions was, and this is something that you should appreciate as technical people, if you have a video clip showing the person, the movement, the class, and so on and so forth, let's say a 10 minute video clip, what will be the size of that clip in megabytes? fairly large, a good quality video showing people, movement, interaction will be fairly large. Here, there are only static slides and voice. So the payload is very, very small. As a result of it, a large number of such spoken tutorials can be packaged into an inexpensive CD costing 10 rupees and can be spread very easily. 
this spokentutorials.org is the site available this is in iit bombay it is maintained by iit bombay on that site hundreds of such spoken tutorials are available they have been created by the team i'll speak a little bit more on how these things are created because that is what is important to us but what is important is they also embarked on another idea that every spoken tutorial although initially prepared in english should be available in every major indian language now how do you do that so they have an english script first let me comment briefly on the essential part of the creation of spoken tutorial they again use open source tools camp studio is one tool which they use to record the voice and the and the slides etc etc it's very easy each one of you can learn to use it in about half an hour's time just download camp studio you need a microphone you don't need a video camera actually you need a microphone to record your voice voice is important voice quality is important because that is what is recorded and heard by people once you have prepared the slide somebody actually speaks in the microphone and records the entire audio that is let's say the first cut thing then somebody is required to write the complete script of whatever you are speaking it has to be a written script so there is lot of golagiri work that you need to do it may take about 2 3 hours to write 8 minutes worth of script some editing etc this is written in english and then somebody with good voice reads that script in sync with the slides which are moving you record everything using camp studio or some such tools presto you have a spoken tutorial now an interesting thing is done that script is published on the net and volunteers are asked whether they are willing to do the following a translate that script into an indian language and b dub the same video in the indian language in somebody else's voice so for the same libre office tutorial now you have a hindi tutorial in libre office you have a telugu tutorial in libre office they even have a bhojpuri tutorial although bhojpuri is associated with some interesting movies etc etc they have a sanskrit tutorial which i don't know whether anybody listens to for real learning but for the first time in this country it is now possible to create educational contents which are available for listening to and seeing the basic knowledge in one's own native language imagine how much our schools and colleges will benefit you are all senior students but i'm sure as i often mention when you join the first year of your college anywhere many of you would have difficulty in understanding english lectures because you would have studied in your own native language you learned english of course very quickly you are all smart people but initially you have that difficulty so till that transition happens how useful such spoken tutorials could be in bahasa indonesia in malay in, in, in whichever language you mention in vietnamese in pashto in, in whatever you can actually create this spoken tutorial now these spoken tutorials have taken a shape there are thousands of people they have trained more than 150000 people through workshops these workshops are conducted and they have trained people to conduct such workshops any one of you can go to a college and conduct a workshop on spoken tutorial on how to create a spoken tutorial and how to use a spoken tutorial for any effect and this is spreading now like wildfire this method we have decided to adapt to at least one if not both the mooks courses that iit bombay will be offering so my course for example let me tell you the preparation that is going on originally i had recorded lectures like the nptel lectures and i was proposing to use them i realized through the experience of mooks that nobody watches one hour long videos this is exactly the feedback that professor kameshwari also received when she tried to run a network course anybody registered for the network course of hers that will probably come next year i do not know anyway so she uses the flip classroom she records the lectures but she records using not camp studio but camtasia another studio is a proprietary product and she has created full lectures but full length lectures 20 minutes 40 minutes lecture and she now understands that those lectures are not very easily readable or viewable so 
I am creating lecture snippets which are eight minutes long, followed by, as I said, activity and so on. And creating such digital contents are exercising my abilities to communicate. I have not yet been able to finalize the first eight video snippets, although I have tried for last, how many days, I think for one month I have been trying. And finally I have concluded that condensed method is best. I have to first prepare a script and read it. There is no substitute. But what we are also trying to do is that the entire CS101 course roughly encompassing about 30 hours equivalent of video recorded contents where I will not appear at all. The video recording is exactly like slides, some animations or some explanations and spoken words. And then script will be made. This script will be outsourced to 10,000 teachers whom we are training in the month of May and June on how to teach basic programming using these methods. And these 10,000 teachers will then be requested to form groups of different linguistic abilities. And that group takes a responsibility of taking some chunks of this, rewriting the script in Telugu, Tamil, Marathi, Hindi, whatever, whatever. One of the group members who has a good voice records that voice and edits that video with that voice. By July, we expect the entire CS101 lectures, MOOCs, course, etc., etc., available in all major Indian languages as well. It is possible to do so. Why I am telling you all of this? This is how the contents would be more relevant in coming years. So far, we have already, always neglected audio and video contents. Our concentration has been on written contents. Written contents are important, but audio contents will become increasingly important. One such tool, for example, which I have speculated and one of my MTech project students will be working on this, is that how do you view an audio file? You know, if you take an audio clip in any editing software also, the clip will look like some waveform, right? Voice is just waveform. Now, if you have a text, you can peruse through that text. You can search F5 and text search on any material that you see there. How do you search in audio? One of the tools that is desperately required is that if the audio truly represent a script which has been pre-written, the script is available somewhere. And in fact, when you record a movie with that audio, you can actually tag that script. You would have seen on television many times, the captions appear as people are speaking, whatever they are speaking appears below that. What is that technology? Individual sentences are not tagged to individual frames. Instead, you write the entire script and let that script flow in that video along with the video and as these people speak. So how nice it would be if you have a tool, if you have a perusal tool that you put your cursor here and automatically a window appears showing you the text of the spoken words here. And as you move the cursor, the text keeps appearing. And you should be able to do a text search on the audio when you say a text search, for example, where did Professor Fatak use the word pointer? So I type pointer and actually on the audio clip, on the concerned tutorial, I automatically am taken to a cursor where the pointer is first mentioned, etc., etc. Such tools may have appeared crazy 10 years ago. They are vital now immediately from today on. It is not uncommon to imagine that in 10 years' time, the seminars that you submit will no more be just text files. You will be required to record your seminar presentation along with the seminar script, not the seminar report. Seminar report may be a 20-page report, but a 10-minute script that you will speak will have to be recorded in audio. That file will have to be submitted along with the audio recording, probably to be used with such a tool. The examiners could be sitting anywhere in Timbuktu and they will peruse this and they will say, okay, this makes sense, they can even award grades in absentia. Today, that is not possible. People have to read 
full 10 page reports they are not if they are away they are unable to watch you make presentation a presentation could be much more succinct focused and will bring out only the salient points of your longer report now such reports can be produced and can be given in audio form in audio video form the important thing is as the network bandwidths increase and become more affordable the full videos will also be possible including your thobda and everything Every, everybody can see whatever okay. now here what i wanted to close this uh, series with is that this is something that we have not been able to or rather we were not willing to spend time on for this particular course because the objective here is to prepare you for effective communication in mechanisms that are currently in use and almost all current mechanisms are written communication printed communication typeset communication we also provided you some glimpse of how effective presentations can be made but in coming years this is what would happen so those of you who are interested after the exams you will now concentrate on your uh, your exams here okay. so those of you who are interested can actually participate in in these efforts and can think of something more interesting to be done in the in the coming years of time the spoken tutorial website if you go to spoken dash uh, tutorials.org you search for spoken tutorials and you will get condensed site immediately there is a tab there on technologies used for spoken tutorial and they will explain the entire of how to record your video i mean audio and so on you will be making your seminar presentation soon a large number of people have to make a seminar presentation when is that due probably after the exam or before the exam? after the exam now i do not know how many of you give mock seminars as uh, every one of us has emphasized time and again that practice is important the practice is the only thing which tells you to make some corrections which highlight some mistakes that you have made and so on so forth. now how do you practice if there are no friends available one simple way of practicing is prepare your seminar presentation for 15 minutes as a spoken tutorial uh, let's say people uh, less intelligent and less prepared in technology than you have been able to look at that site and have been able to create spoken tutorial so here is a suggestion whenever you are required to present your seminar or for that matter any presentation any time which is 10 to 15 minutes long assemble your slides and record a complete spoken tutorial then write the script for that spoken tutorial when you write the script you will understand that the mistakes that you make in language english mistakes grammar mistakes some mistakes in not emphasizing properly some point mistakes in reading the entire slide rather than speaking in your own words all of this could be eliminated just a simple 15 minute recording followed by listening to that record followed by jotting down something and probably one more re record in about 4 hours time you can make your seminar presentation even now of a much better quality than what it would otherwise so this is what i would leave uh, as the last thought with you uh, the now i come to the more unpleasant point uh, first of all thank you very much a majority of people have actually participated quite enthusiastically in different activities that we had including the group activity which generated a lot of interest uh, sadly i have no way of knowing who were the sleeping partners in these groups but you always give a benefit of doubt to the group if the group does a submission everybody from the group takes the credit so that's okay with us the mundane point which is unpleasant is that the institute senate has set some rules i had mentioned this to you i am not a fan of compulsory attendance but i understand that in a pass fail course apart from the assignments and attendance there is absolutely nothing else for me to judge people so a few days ago i had announced that i would expect 100% attendance in the last two weeks and i would expect all submissions to be made now there are some people who had not submitted their ted talk thing 
There are some people who did not participate in the group activity. There are some people who did not submit that, uh, uh, some, uh, there was a submission, the, uh, that was the TED Talk summary itself. I think we had identified four submissions, right? L uh, there was an invite email to be written. There was a literature survey to be submitted. There was a mind map to be submitted. And there was a presentation on mind map to be submitted. Now, are there people here who have not done one of these four things? Please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. And there could be some who are even now missing the class altogether. It is obligatory that you all make some submissions so that I can record them and I can award the pass grade. Attendance was obligatory. People who have not attended these lectures in the last two weeks must send me an email and must meet me. So that if, if they have missed only one lecture here or there and if they have sent me an email appropriately, don't bother. But people who have missed many of these lectures, I must meet with them. I must give them some extra work in lieu of those three hours or four hours that are missed so that I can legitimately award a pass grade. Let me tell you, when anybody fails, the person feels bad, but the teacher feels more bad. I hate to fail anybody. I try not to fail people at all. For 40 years, I have tried this hard, and yet I am disappointed because somebody or the other, I have to fail. Now, I, at least this once I would like that in a pass-fail course, I don't fail anybody. And the only way I will do it is either you have complied with the attendance and submissions. I, if you have submitted late, it's okay. But as long as you have submitted, there's no problem. Okay. Now the list of people whose submissions are not with us, uh, can we put up such a list? Uh, there will be, this is the last lecture as I had announced. There is one more week of instructions, technically. But I do not want to engage you in a classroom fashion like this in that week. Most of you who have been doing their work diligently can use that next week for working on your own topics. But those who have a backlog of submissions or attendance must work during the next week. Equivalent of whatever three, four hours of work is required, but that work should be done and that submission should be made. I will be submitting my grade to the institute coordinator by next Friday. Before next Friday, I must have all missing submissions. I am requesting Firuza to compile information on the roll numbers about whom we do not have complete clarity of submission. So we'll, we'll provide the complete roll list, which is there on the, uh, we'll, we'll publish it on the Moodle, and we'll also put it up on uh, maybe uh, on, on the notice board or something, because there are some people who are not registered on the mood. Most of the roll numbers would have a tick against them, which means they are okay, they have submitted, they have attended. But those roll numbers which appear with a question mark, I think they must meet either me, Firuza or Nagesh over the uh, uh, first two days of the next week, Monday and Tuesday. You can do so because there is Monday lecture will still be held uh, next week on Tuesday, right? Because Monday has been declared a holiday, so the lecture will be on Tuesday. So those of you who wish, you can meet uh, both of us immediately after that lecture, whenever. But it is vital that people with that question mark should meet us. By Monday, we'll put up that list. And as I said, my only humble request is, please cooperate and permit me at least for the first time in 45 years that not a single student fails from my class. It has never happened. So you can create history if possible. But unfortunately, the majority of the people cannot contribute to this wish. It is only the small minority which, which can contribute. So I will conclude by requesting the majority to do one thing. Please go out of your way to find out who are the other jokers who have registered but not shown up in this class. <laughs> or don't show up in the class or don't submit or something like that. They must be somebody's friend. I, I cannot believe that at MTEC and PhD level, uh, everybody is not known by someone other or not. 
Of course, if I am known by two other people and those two people only know me and only three of us know each other and all three of us bunk, then I do not know how to handle that situation. I simply hope that uh, basic human instinct will not permit such a situation to happen. So with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much and uh, best of luck.